You get one chance to write your, your debut novel. And I didn't want to leave anything on the cutting floor that I would regret. Trevor knew where to go and it was the queerness in his makeup told him that I can be loving, even though everything around me tells me that I should destroy everything yeah. I love. Ocean, I am so delighted to speak to you today. When I first started my book club um, at Service 95 and I was kind of putting down my list of authors who I would dream to talk to, you were at the top of my list. Oh. And... So I'm just so happy that we get a chance to, 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 to speak. Oh, that's, that's so precious. Can I just say, I'm, I'm, it's, it's so rare, as many people know, for a musician, not only just to write her own music, to set her, you know, her own stories forward, but to foster literacy and storytelling. Um, it, it's such a, such a, special thing this you could do any there's so many things that you do and you could continue to do but for you to center reading and storytelling um mm. is, is such a remarkable feat and it makes it really really special and i think you know my students at nyu this is the biggest clout i'll ever have <laughs> with them um they'll finally listen to everything i say after this i, I hope oh, as <laughs> if as if I, we can I dream love, we can dream uh, yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, I, I love. I love books. I love storytelling, and and I'm so excited to talk about your debut novel on Earth. We're briefly gorgeous. I mean, it, you know, it was released in 2019, and it and it comes with huge acclaim, and it continues to be at the top of so many people's all time favorite book lists. But I have to say, like, you had me at the title. Like, mm. I knew that this book was going to have a massive impact on me before I even turned the page. I love how it takes the form of a letter that a young man called Little Dog writes to his illiterate mother. I, I, I love how the letter takes us backwards and forwards and reveals mm. new layers of perception at each turn. And I, I just found it so incredibly moving. And, you know, along the way, we learn the effect of family trauma and the immigrant experience and particularly the gay immigrant experience and... I, I just think it's, it's, I mean, you do such a wonderful job at depicting the story throughout, but there's mm. drug addiction and there's loss, but there's also so much solidarity and love in it. It's, it's so layered and beautiful. And first of all, I want to thank you for it because it's also been at the top of my recommendations list. It's like one of those books that once you finish it, you're like, shit, I don't know what I'm going to read next. That's going to be able to like top it. You know, oh, you almost don't want it to finish. And that's also so been the reaction of so many people who I've recommended the book to. So thank you for that. Oh, that's so, so sweet. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this this very, very special novel. Oh gosh, that's so sweet. It, it's the highest praise coming from a musician because, you know, I chose the epistolary form because I wanted to put language at its most pressurized and highest stakes. And that is when it is addressed to a person. And that is the most common method in songs, right? There's always a mm. me and a you. There's always, always a you, always. Yeah. And that's why the power of music is that it interrupts us with intimacy. I'd love to know how you describe this book. Is it autobiographical fiction? Is it like a therapeutic love letter? You were already a very successful poet, you know, when you wrote this. So in some senses, is it also a, a long form poem? Well, I think, you know, the more I talk to you, the more I realize how much of, of my thinking is owed to music um, and musicians mm. constantly breaching genres, um, even in your own work, but even, you know, going back to Michael Jackson, David Bowie, um, James Brown, uh, MGK. Um, I think it's much more fluid for musicians to breach new ground in genre. Whereas in contemporary uh, literary circles, it's much harder. You know, you have to almost declare yourself, oh, now it's poetry, now it's... And a lot of that is the commerce. Where do we put this on a shelf in a bookstore, right? Um, but I've always loved troubling these fixed ideas, finding where they can be broken. And so 
I ventured into this novel as a poet. I just had this belief that the tools that I learned in poetry can be used in the novel and maybe not make the novel better, but make a, a different way to see the novel um, mm. using the techniques of the poet, which is a lot of breaks, a lot of vignettes, right? Um, whereas the traditional novel writing workshop will tell you, follow the protagonist through day to day, map out how they got here, the logistical bodily functions. And as a poet, I knew that if I stop the scene and pick up another scene, the reader will be there, just like mm -hmm. in a song, verse from verse, stanza to stanza, and then pattern making. You know, this is not so much of a linear plot as it is pattern, very similar to the chorus or a refrain mm. in a, a song or even orchestral music, you know, having that, 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 that refrain that returns the pieces, the backbone. So I orchestrated using this very, I don't know, I think to me, I wanted to be kind of like a troublemaker in all of these ideas and bring mm -hmm. poetry to the novel rather than transform myself to fit the novel's taste. And, you know, I got a lot of pushback. You know, when I was trying to sell it, a lot of editors told me, you have too many ideas in here. You have mm. too many themes. You need to pick just the immigrant one because it's easier to sell. You got to take away the drug abuse, um, the opioid epidemic, take away the queer stuff, like narrow it down. You have too many endings at one point. And again, I just leaned on music and I said, in a way, this is an album. Yeah. You know, there's many modes to an album. You need your sad songs. You need the songs you want to dance to, right? And I wanted to totally. have it live like a collection of poems or an album. Mm. I also heard you describe yourself as a radical artist where you just do what you like. And I love that. <laughs> and I think, uh, well, that's, I think that's really cool because, you know, regardless of the amount of pushback that you may have had, you persevered, you stuck by the thing that was important to you in the way that you wanted to tell your story. And the payoff is the greatest thing, you know, when you know that you did it your way. Oh my God, that's, that's so beautiful to say. Uh, yeah, I, on one hand, it feels really powerful to say I'm a radical artist. I, I think if I, if I look at it deeply, and I wonder how you feel. I just think for me, I felt really like I snuck into this art. I snuck into this world. And... I'm, I, you can say, okay, he's radical, it's brave, it's courageous. On the other hand, I just thought the expectations for my life was so low. Mm. You know, I come from immigrants who raised me. And, and my mother one day said, son, if you work at McDonald's as a manager, that's a good life. That's a salary. That's health care. So I, had, I already had freedom to be radical from the people who raised me. Mm. You know, I, I don't want to take all this credit of like, oh, I am such a auteur. I want to I want to point back to the women who raised me. I was raised by three women, my aunt, my mother and my grandmother. And I saw the radicalness in them. They just if it did not work for them, they don't care. They don't care if it's normal, if it's the rule. Right. And that's because they came from a, a society and a culture in a country that was falling apart from war. Mm -hmm. And so the only rule for them is that does it work for us? If it doesn't, we don't have to mimic them. They had no idea or care for the American dream, whatever that was. Yeah. Right? Everything had to fit the needs of their children and themselves. And I think I stubbornly just, just learned it from them. I'm curious with your family background, if you had that same pressure or did did you feel free because often the, the cliche of immigrants is like oh there's this kind of upward mobility we want to be doctors and do good by society but on the on the other hand my immigrants were like go off yeah. do whatever you want <laughs> like go off we yeah. don't care right <laughs> yeah I and and I I have exactly you know maybe not exactly the same experience but a very similar experience where both my parents were just like OK, are you sure this is what you want to do? You know, you can have a stable life if you choose to go to university and maybe try to get a job or like get a normal job. But they were like, if this is what you want to do, go for it. You know, oh. try, try yeah. and just see 
what happens. I think also like for my parents who have been through two wars, it's kind of like, what is the worst that could happen? You know, all you have to do is try. And I think that is what I've watched them do their whole life is constantly reinvent themselves and do multiple jobs and try do things. And it was all about how do we make sure that I felt like I wasn't missing anything out when I was a kid. Beautiful. And then Beautiful. from watching them work so hard, I was like, all right, the ethic is work and that's what you have to do. And then if you want to do something, you just have to try and you can't take no yeah. for an answer. And I think that is what's really been um, ingrained in me and I guess in you too. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's like they're like, look, we, we, we shouldn't be here. We made it here. We already won. So whatever mm-hmm. you make of your life, if you try hard enough, that's the whipped cream. It's mm. just extra. Like right now I'm talking to you, this is the whipped cream of my life. I've been lucky <laughs> to be living in it for the past 10 years. I'm living in the whipped cream, right? Because it was not expected of me. I did not have a path to it. I was not handed an education, mm. money, none of that. I was just handed a free reign to be who I wanted to be because the women in my family just did not care for respectability or finding a good position in life. They're like, we had enough. We went through war. If you have a full stomach at the end of the day, do whatever makes you happy. And Mm. it's so important to say that because I think we get overburdened by this kind of respectable immigrant story of like pay back, do well, fit into society. Um, But that's so antagonistic to the artist's role. Like, we have to do everything to upend the social norms, to find a new way of singing, dancing, embodying ourselves. And I'm just so, so pleased to see you do that as well in your work, in your career. It's just such a... But I, I see it, I get it. I'm like, no, she got the free lane. She, she got the wind in her sails. The people who fought for her to be here, mm. they're honoring that path by letting her be herself. And it's, it's so beautiful to see, Dua. Yeah, thank you. I feel very lucky and I love that. I'm living in the whipped cream. I'm living in the whipped cream. Like, I, I, I feel that. I, I As your title for your for your memoir one day. That's, <laughs> yeah, I'm living in the whipped cream, honey. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous a little bit. Um, and let's talk about the narrator, Little Dog and his mother, Rose. So as an immigrant from Vietnam, Rose can't read English. She can't really speak it either. And Little Dog has kind of been her portal to the English-speaking world around her ever since they emigrated to the US Mm. um, in the aftermath of the war. And a big part of Little Dog's own story is the evolution as a writer Um, and the way he uses language not just to express himself but also as a way to understand his identity and and his past. And... I think there's an irony because the further he progresses into the English language, the bigger the distance is from his mother. Yeah. And the opening lines of the book are, Dear Ma, I'm writing to reach you, even if each word I put down is one word further from where you are. I mean, that just, it just, it absolutely, it breaks my heart. I mean, tell tell me, tell me about this, this contradiction, like how a letter to his mother could in some way actually push them apart? Well, for many immigrants, it's the, particularly immigrants with language barriers, it's the quintessential story of American success, which is side by side with American loneliness and mm. American isolation. The, the further you make it, particularly in writing and language, the further away you are from the people who brought you here. And mm. I, I... I, I, I associate it with, you know, this idea of sending your child off on a boat. And, you know, you think as an immigrant that you're doing it for them. They're depending on you. You have English. You're going to find a job, find a career. And you're, t- you're, you're driving this boat with all of them with you. And you hear their voices behind you. Go on, son, go. Go find find your dreams, study hard, go to school, get the degrees. And you feel their their support. 
And then one day you notice that the voices are very quiet. And maybe you're starting to build a career, build a life. And you turn around to show them what you earned, a prize, a publication. And you realize they're gone. They were standing at the dock the whole time. They could have never been with you because the life of us education is an isolated one. It's an independent one. Mm. And, and you can only help them with what you have, but they're not with you. And the fact that most of my family can't read my work is a, is a you know, ultimate metaphor, summation of that journey. But it was also something that excited me because what is a message in a bottle thrown into the sea and then never found? What is the point of language if the you is not there anymore or will never be there or was never there in the first place? Then the crisis falls on language itself. Can the act of writing for someone who will never hear it, does that do anything for the speaker? Does that do anything for the self? Can it build a world? Can it get little dog to say things to his mother he could never tell her in person, right? Mm. So in a way, the, deny of, the denying of a listener allows the confessor to say more than he ever would if his mother could just pick up the book and read it herself, right? The, the, the queer love story, the fraught sexuality, the intimacy, the heartbreak, all of the things that he went through, he might not even want to burden or hurt his mother with his pain. And so in a way, the only way this letter is possible is that she can't read it. And yet it denies them the ultimate bridge. And that contradiction is not only American life, but modern life at large. I guess the way that I was likening it is kind of in the way that, you know, the monarch butterflies appear through the novel. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning, they're tragic because the migrating butterfly dies before it can return to where it's come from. And I just... I think that, I don't know, the contradiction in, in the way that a letter could somehow push them yeah, further apart, yeah. I thought was incredibly moving. I mean, it, it's still a mystery. You know, scientists don't know why they know or how they know where to go. And they land on the same tree at times from the generation in the years prior. Mm. Um, and there are even some moments where you see in their migratory route a great swerve. And it seems like they're swerving around nothing. And scientists have always seen around the coast of Mexico this big swerve. And they thought, gosh, why is there they're getting blown by the wind? There's no wind current. And then only much later, through archaeological digging, they realized there used to be a volcano hundreds of years ago uh, where they stood, right? So so they're, they're even, there's a phantom limb. They're responding to something already gone. And so they are, they're, 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 their memory becomes an archive of the earth um, through the wounds and healings that the earth has gone through geographically. And it, it raised this question of even if you don't make it, right, it takes five generations of monarchs to make one flight from Canada to Mexico, but even if you don't make it, something is passed on, some mm. information, right? So it, it, it kind of answers your question about the letters. Like, even if you don't speak, you you still embody your your parents, their fears. It's in our mitochondria. It's it's in totally the, the generational ticks. trauma. We keep it. We we carry yeah. it in some way. We it gets passed it. down for sure. It's knowledge. Mm. It's good knowledge, unhelpful or helpful, but it's knowledge and. And I think in, in a way, a letter is so important. It's also moot, right? Sometimes there are these moments I'm interested in, and I don't know how you feel, with our parents where touch and proximity is also a kind of communication where I can, I can anticipate what they would think, what they would say. 1,000%. Even now, my mom has, has, has passed you know, for five years, and I still look at things and her voice her opinions, her judgment on things, mm. her sassiness, you know, um, comes through 
and informs how I think. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I know you're gone, but somehow I've I've inherited your mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. It's funny because they, they, they say, you know, as you get older, you become more and more like your parents. And I feel like mm. I used to like reject that thing of like, no, I can't be, I have to be my own person. I can't be turning into my parents, but I hear their voice all the time. And as I get older, sometimes even how I speak with my younger siblings, I'm like, oh shit, that's something my mom would say. Or like, that's yeah. so my dad or like, you know, whatever it is. It's like, yeah. I completely feel that. It's touch, touch and proximity, you're right. It lives on through us, you know. Blood is yeah. thicker than water, for sure. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> and now I'm proud of it. I've said, oh, there you are, mom. There yeah, you are. it's beautiful. Let's dig a little deeper with Rose and little dog. You know, it's a, it's a very tender relationship in many ways, but it's also scarred by abuse. And there's this particular scene, which, which I found quite sad for both of them, actually. It's when little dog tells her that he was being bullied on the school bus mm. and he's wearing those sneakers with the flashing lights. So, you know, you can tell that he's clearly pretty young. Um, I think that's kind of the detail that, that, that really got me. And he, and he tells Rose about being bullied and she hits him and she tells him, be a real boy and strong. What, what does this say about their relationship and Rose's own experience mm. with, with violence and maybe even the way that she views masculinity. Uh, that's a, I'm so happy you said that, brought up that scene. I think it's a very important scene because it's so complicated and I wanted the complexity of that to sit without resolution, you know? And I think I, that scene is so important because it articulates the frustration, or I hope it articulates the frustration of Rose's helplessness mm. as a mother who doesn't speak English. And she basically says, you can't tell me this. You can tell this to a white American parent and then they will go to the principal, they will write a letter, mm. a sternly worded letter to the Board of Education and have it resolved. They'll, ha they'll start a petition, they'll... <laughs> join other moms against bullying, right? All these wonderful things of agency. And I think ultimately that scene is about who has the power to change one's life. And Rose being so, gone through so much and being so wise, she knows that she has no voice in this world. And to, in a moment to protect herself, she, this is so hard for me to hear that my son is being bullied and I am, equally as helpless as him and the boy doesn't know yeah. because the boy thinks their parent is a superhero you are the mother you are the north star everything revolves around you you must be able to come in and just solve it fix it yeah and he he, he tries and she and then he learns that she's limited and she says if you can't resolve it don't even tell me because i can't bear it you know and then that that excruciating feeling of seeing your child hurt and not able to help them at all in this new world, in this new country. She says what I think most or anyone who loves their child would do. Like, you got to find a way because I don't have it for you. And the lack of methods is actually a very common immigrant experience, right? Um, you all, in this country, we're always told that there's there always a way. If there's a will, there's a way, right? Pull yourself from your bootstraps. Like this myth of American excellence comes from determination. But Rose being so wise knows that she, those rules don't apply to people like her. And so she then turns the assignment on her son and says, you now have to be kind of an artist. You need to figure out the impossible because my, my path to help you has ended here. Um, and it's an incredible moment. And it's followed by another scene um, right after in which she does something that she can do. She says, drink milk. Right? So she pours him a glass of milk after denying him her protection and say, this is going to make you grow. And so the myth of all that, and of course, that happened to me. Mm. I'm five foot three. 
it didn't really work. Uh, <laughs> I might have maybe the milk I didn't help you grow. <laughs> maybe I was I was destined to be five one, and I got two inches from all that. I don't know, right? I mean, um, whatever it was, but the, again, mythology, mm. storytelling, like the mom having no power, then creates power for herself. Say, like, well, I'm gonna just make sure. I'm gonna bring you milk. I'm gonna make sure you get the best milk so that you can defend yourself. Mm. Whether it works or not, it's almost mood, but it's this desire to work around helplessness that I was really, really interested in. Yeah, you're telling this to someone whose mom told her to go and play basketball because it might help her grow. And <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it, it was only once I, work? well, once I stopped, I used to be, yeah, I used to be. Uh, like five foot four and then once I stopped I mean it took me a while to like hit puberty and everything like I was a very late bloomer overall but once I stopped playing basketball I did grow so whether that worked mm. or not I don't know your body but, was like uh, I'm, I'm gonna show mom it's like, I'm gonna that, show mom <laughs> <laughs> um I want to talk about Lan briefly I loved Lan she's Rose's mother and little dog's grandmother and Clearly she's suffering from some major PTSD from the war and we know that her purple dress kept her alive. So she had to turn to sex work to, to, to survive. T tell me about her character. She was inspired by my own grandmother um, who was born without a name, which is very common in the countryside in Vietnam. You, you know, the parent or often the father is number one and the first the first child would be number two. And my grandmother was seven. So her only name was seven. And she was the sixth child born um, in a family ultimately that would be nine. And she was the only one um, with, again, that kind of stubborn, maybe, again, we're talking about epigenetic, epigenetic knowledge mm. and radicalness. She was the only radical one where she's like, I'm not going to just be a farmer. I want to find a, a way out of here. Um, and then, you know, she, but instead she was forced into an arranged marriage with a man 30 years older than her when she was just 17 years old. She, she bore him one child, um, you know, and she escapes, you know, and, and that's almost like a death sentence in very conservative rural uh, Vietnam. You, you, you. You know, you're, you're humiliated, you've shamed your family, you know, after a, a great wedding, how dare you, you know, forsake this. Mm. And she ran away and she came to her parents and said, I, I don't want to live like this. Is there another way? And they said no. So very similar to Rose and Little Dog's conversation about lack of capacity, the limits of your freedom. And they said, and so the mother gave her a... a, a a pearl necklace, her only piece of value and say, you need to leave the village and you got to find a way. I cannot help you, right? The same story passed on again and again. And, and my grandmother, uh, Bai, which is seven, goes to the city in Saigon during wartime and there were soldiers and she turned to sex work, the oldest profession in our species, right? Women have been feeding themselves and f gaining their own independence using the thing that causes nothing, which is mm. their body, right? Mm. Um, and so I wanted to honor that and I didn't want to be ashamed of that. You know, in my, I get emotional thinking about it, but in my own life, in my interviews, I said like, I, I came from women who you know, supported their children and themselves with their bodies. And I think that's so, um, it's so important to say, and say, you know, and, and then the conditions that forced them into that role. Um, and the, the first thing she does is she uses language and she calls herself Lan, which means orchid. Mm. And the orchid is the most like robust and vibrant and, you know, spiky and grand flower there is, right? It's the flower that you give people when they have a new home, it, when, when they get married. You know, it's, mm. it's, a, it's such a wildly um, animalistic and vibrant flower. It's full of life, full of agency, full of possibility. And here's a woman who, you know, escaped a doomed life and said, 
I'm going to name myself Orchid. I'm not seven anymore. Mm. Um, so like that life was like already a novel to me. I was like, I, you know, I can't believe it. Why make up? I don't need to make up sci-fi or, yeah. you know, fantasy. Like the people, the women in my life are as inspiring as Marvel superheroes, Batman, Star Wars, Princess Leia, like, they already lived that life. Oh, I'm yeah. inspired by them. And my grandmother is up there with my other hero, Dostoevsky, Toni Morrison. Like, that's in the same pantheon. Mm. I don't have a hierarchy between, you know, those cultural heroes and the people in my family. And it's, it's that was her life. I, you know, and it was, it, it formed a, such an important role in the book because the artistic self, making of the self, and being disobedient, right? Especially as an Asian woman, to be disobedient to the structures as a method, right? That you can pass on to your daughter and then her son and her children is, is such a valuable thing, especially as refugees. You know, we always think refugees are helpless. They have nothing but the shirt on their back, the National Geographic or the New York Times will always take photos of the refugee in flight, grabbing mm -hmm. their children, helpless, asking, begging, beseeching governments for safety. But I want to turn that on its head a bit and say, like, the refugee comes with a set of artistic tools that are so robust and so complicated that it's actually creative force. The refugee is a creative superpower. And that was what I saw in my grandmother, despite all of her mental illnesses and struggles. She wasn't without all that. But she showed me that, you know, if you want to live in the whipped cream, you make it yourself. Mm. And then you, you give yourself a new name. That's incredible. That's unbelievable. I, 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 I'm so moved by that. And, and the power of a woman who has had the ability to, to have autonomy and control and to choose disruption in her own terms I think that is really really moving okay we need to talk about Trevor mm. so in the story little dog meets Trevor when he's working a summer job on a tobacco farm while he's still in high school and Trevor's from a working class family he listens to 50 cent all day he lives in a mobile home with his alcoholic dad um from whom he's definitely inherited a, a, a stereotyped understanding of American masculinity. Um, and yet him and Little Dog have this very intense sexual relationship that kind of veers quite wildly between rough and tender. And he says to, to, to Little Dog, goes, you think you'll be really gay, like forever? And mm. there's a there's a dangerous edge to Trevor but unlike um unlike many of the other characters in the book his violence really kind of turns inwards I guess he has a lot of demons doesn't he the Trevor character is is so crucial and important to me I I've known many Trevors um mm. I've seen them come and go I've seen them I've seen them lose themselves I see society lose them I've seen society throw them away and I, want, I was curious to ask this question of myself for the novel, which is, what happens if a boy like Trevor is, inherits all the things that should be poisonous? American masculinity, the toxicness of it, the loneliness, the isolation. I mean, I've seen, I've seen boys be so afraid to be feminine that they deny themselves their own humanity. I've watched growing up, you know, in America, boys who are so afraid of putting their arms around each other's shoulder, even though they want it so much. And mm. this is, per, you know, straight boys who just, because you're, you're a human being, right? We, yeah. we, have, we, have, we have told each other in this country that a, for a boy to touch another boy is a death sentence of, of gayness. And you know, but then you live your whole life like that. You deny yourself. And now we have this, this, this epidemic of, you know, straight male suicide. And mm. one of the diagnoses is that 
men in their 20s and 30s don't know how to ask each other out for companionship because they're so afraid. It's so fraught. They don't want to be misunderstood as asking someone on a date, right? It's so awkward to ask a male companion to just hang out. Hang out. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so sad to me. It's like this, it's so deprived of humanity. Like, like we, we think of America as a place of progress. We have, you know, incredible arsenal of weapons, pharmaceuticals, technology, uh, uh, money-making enterprises. And yet we're so primitive here in how we deal and make possible tenderness. And so many other societies that we, we America calls backward is way ahead in human relations. Totally. And I wanted to, to upend that. And, and the easy thing is to say that Trevor is just trapped and he's doomed. And, but what is important for me to insist that this story is not a tragic story because of queerness. It's tragic because it's America. <laughs> America is a tragic story. Um, if, shall it remain so? I don't know. Um, I don't know what's ahead in its future. But it's important for me to say that this is not a tragic story because of queerness. Queerness is what makes the story magical. Mm. Um, it's tragic because of opioid epidemic. It's tragic because Purdue Pharma, as Nan Golden so beautifully fought against the Sackler family, um, you know, poisoned this region before we had a term for it, the opioid epidemic, right? Um, and Trevor was a victim of American commercial greed, but he's not a victim of his own queerness. And for that character, I wanted to ask, what, what happens if he doesn't have any role model to act tenderness and care for a little dog? Where does that come from? Right. So there's a moment, of a critical moment, where they have a botched sex scene, right? Mm -hmm. And it's messy, it's botched, they don't have any role models, they don't, no one told them the birds and the bees story. And it's a, it's a story very common for, for, for gay men and boys, you know. And you expect Trevor to kind of shove Little Dog away or kind of punish him. And Trevor does something that only Trevor has. No one taught him this. He goes and he bathes his friend in the river in the most tender, merciful way. And he basically rescues his friend out of shame. And I think for me, it's like, I wanted to show that queerness is a power inside us, that even if you don't even have a name for it, never in a single dialogue tag do they call each other queer. The word queer is just never used purposefully in the book because I wanted to ask the question, what, what happens to, does, if queerness is a force rather than a name, a social category, an identity marker, it's just a force and it's a force of goodness. God forbid it's a force of goodness in somebody, right? And that's what happens. Trevor realizes something that no one taught him. His father, his, his family, his culture did not teach him to do this, to, be, to act care, to, to save somebody with mercy and dignity mm. he does it it's just in him just yeah. like the monarchs inherently just yeah. like the monarchs they knew where to go trevor knew where to go and it was the queerness in his makeup mm. the natural the natural queerness in him told him that i can be loving even though everything around me tells me that i should destroy I should, everything yeah. i love let's talk a little bit more about that sex scene that you just mentioned between Trevor and Little Dog. You know, I, li I listened to your interview that you did with Sam Smith. Um, yeah, yeah, on the oh, Pink, Sam's so sweet. Pink House podcast <laughs> recently, which yeah. to everyone who's listening, I, I highly recommend that. And, um, and you said that when you were writing it, it meant that you'd never be invited to Oprah's book club. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true, um, but you're always welcome here. But there's actually a much more serious point here is is that your book is actually being banned in some u.s districts and there's mm. like an alarming mm. trend in challenging and banning books in the u.s particularly those of lgbtq plus authors and it's happening at alarming rates and and i'm i'm just i guess for me i'm wondering how do you 
respond to something like that? Well, it, it makes it ever the more important, you know. Mm. Um, that scene was one of the last edits I had in my book. And we were already in production schedule. And I just told my editor, I said, I have this scene that I, look, I've been trying to be brave enough to write it because I just didn't want to have a sex scene there just to be edgy. Like, that's not my artistic impulse to just mm -hmm. be new for the sake of being new. I want it to be meaningful. And I said, there's a, there's a chance here to turn this scene that we see, all, you know, that we think about all the time as strictly pornographic, right? The rim job. But I, can, I think I, there's a chance, there's opportunity to displace that meaning, salvage, rescue that meaning into a new meaning of mercy, mm -hmm. salvage and rescue and self-dignity. And my editor was like, it's going to be hard, you know, to, to make this, this is, it can be hard for it to be palatable. But, you know, bless her heart, you know, she listens, she's a queer woman, Anne Godoff, she's a legend, she's published Zadie Smith, Thomas Pynchon, Will Smith, you know, she's seen it all. Mm. And I don't think any other editor would have given me permission, to be honest. I mean, like a younger, maybe a stray person, I don't know, but... I, I don't think someone would have been able to sit at that late in the production, right? I mean, we at this point, we've already gotten green light from salespeople, reps. Everybody has read the book. And here I am, like, plopping, like, One more. <laughs> like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. this kind of, like, explosion in the middle of it. And she's sitting, hearing me talk, and she says, at the end of, of my explanation, she says, you know what? You're right. We're going to go to print. I'm just going to, I'm ride, I'm going to ride or die with you on this. Wow. I have chills. It's amazing having someone who really rides for you. Who's like there. You get one chance to write your, your debut novel. And I didn't want to leave anything on the cutting floor that I would regret. Regret is like my worst enemy. You know, yeah. it's like so much in my life has been regret, regret. And I just did not want to do that anymore. The banning is not surprising. You know, you don't prepare you know, young people for queer intimacy. And then, then you punish books that affirm this because you're uncomfortable with it yourself. And it's such a, a self-absorbed, you know, fear. And it, it lacks empathy. And I'm not surprised that, you know, with the rise of, of alt-right and conservative movements all over the world, we're seeing this pushback. I, see, I have the pushback in Vietnam as well, right? And America is historically been like the beacon and influencer. So whatever happens in America, for better and for worse, influences so much of the world. And I'm seeing this domino effect of these bans happening. Um, but it's always been this way, right? Mm. Every epoch, every generation has to make its own determination. You know, the living are outnumbered by the dead. The dead has had... They outnumber us and they've had their time and they've had their say in their time. And we have to have an open discourse and determine what's valuable for us. And so the bright side of it for me is that the bands create this discourse. It, it's have, I mean, someone went to one of the meetings um, in Texas about my book and they said, look, they're, they're having real conversations about anal sex that I've never, <laughs> like, I'm just like, <laughs> Like they're real, they're asking hard yeah, questions. At least, of one you know, <laughs> the conversations are happening, you know, and that, and that's, and that's what you want, yeah, you know? Yeah. I'm like, Hey, if they, if, if they, if it, if it converts them to expand their horizons and know that it doesn't harm their sexuality in any way, yeah. then my job is done. Thank exactly. Goodness. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to. It's amazing, isn't it? I never expected anything from this book. I just thought. Mm. It's a weird book. It's a book that I wanted to write on my own terms. It's a nerdy, difficult book. It jumps around in time. You know, it has all the things that I I need. But and, and I just thought, gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write it. It's gonna fall into a black hole, and I'll go back to being a poet. I have that, you know, that mm. little corner, and that's always there for me. And I think, I think being a poet first a lot, gave me that courage to say, let me just do what I want here and then retreat mm. and hide when the, when the rotten tomatoes come, I can hide into, in the poet corner and be mm. safe. Um, 
And I think if I wasn't a poet first, I think I would have been much more um, conventional uh, and, pull, and, and, and you know, pull back a lot of these maneuvers that I did. But I, I luckily, and, and to this day, I, someone much smarter than I with a PhD could probably tell you why this book has been so popular. But to me, I'm still kind of shocked. Like it, it mm. doesn't, it doesn't hit like the the bestseller like attributes, right? Plot, you know, resolution, antagonist, like a protagonist overcoming an antagonist. Like there's no victims and there's no villains in this book. And someone much smarter than I can explain it. But to me, I'm like, I don't, I still don't know why or how this book did what it is. I'm grateful, but I just kind of wanted to write the weird thing and I'm surprised that I'm talking to you now, but I'm really grateful for it. <laughs> you were so authentic to yourself and it and it worked out. And I think that's the other thing about, you know, making art is like maybe we put so much pressure on the idea that something has to be successful or it has to be like the biggest thing we do. It's as long as we stay true to ourselves, write the thing that we want to do, make something that you're proud of. If something amazing happens with it, amazing. Yes. Great. Yes. And if it yes. doesn't, it's okay. You just make something else and you carry yeah. on your like creative journey. That's what it is. That's what it's about, you know, when you're an artist yeah. and when you're a writer and a creative and you just keep it moving. A hundred percent. I'd love to know what's coming next for you, Ocean. I um, I heard that on Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous as being adapted for the screen. Yeah. Can you yeah. reveal anything about that? Um, I. It's funny you ask. I just had a, a producer meeting earlier in the morning Amazing. um so uh we're in the final edits of the script and it's just been such a beautiful difficult um journey because it's challenging because i again that's a pro i never i never wrote this book for the screen you know mm. like when a24 came and said we want to make this film i said really you don't think you know i'm like how would you do it they're like well i don't know you know anyone's everyone says it that we'll make it exactly how you wrote it and i said really it's really? gonna look like a <laughs> two-hour music video like on cocaine you know and, <laughs> and they're like okay yeah yeah right right we gotta like okay let's let's find a way flesh so it out yeah flesh it out. so it's been really really cool to see and uh we're 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 close um we're, we're ever closer to the finish line. So I'm really, really pleased. Amazing. Congratulations. That sounds really exciting. I'm really looking yeah. forward to that. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how it's all, you know, changed and also how you've preserved the bits of the story and added to it. You mm, know, I think, yeah. I think that's going to be interesting for everyone who's a fan to kind of dive into it in a, in a different format. Me too. But I've also, I appreciate that the, it took, the book got a chance to be a book. Yeah. That's really important to me. You know, like the option was, was it was optioned before the book came out. And a lot of times the book, uh, you know, people announced that right away with the book's announcement. But I just didn't want readers to feel like the book was out of their hands and into a production company. I wanted readers to have a relationship as you had, which I'm really with, grateful yeah. for, for the book. And then the, the, the film comes as whipped cream. It's just extra, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Ocean, thank you so much for joining me today. This is one of my favorite books. And oh to spend time talking to you about it has been a real, real privilege. Um, Likewise, do I. I want to take a moment to remind everyone to go to service95.com because you've given us an amazing reading list and a playlist. Um which I can't wait to check out, as well as a really beautiful reading from the novel. Um, and anyone who signs up to the Service 95 Book Club newsletter will also get all of this exclusive content in the monthly roundup. Ocean, thank you again so, so, so much. I have absolutely loved this conversation. Thank you so much, Duo. I can't wait to go to one of your concerts with a giant can of whipped cream. I'm sure yeah, please. It. You'll know please, what it means. Please, please, please. I need you. <laughs> I need, I, we need to like hang out in person. I would love you to come to a show. Just let me know. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. That'd be really fun. All right, my dear. So lovely to chat to you. Thank you. Ciao.